Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out some very cool new shoes from Specialized. There's an extremely stiff hardtail. We also check out some rather expensive handguards, some cool comments from you, and the quiz returns. Okay, so starting off this week's show, I'd like to talk a little bit about Atherton bikes. Now I'm extremely excited about what they've been doing with the bikes anyway, because I think the additive manufacturing with the titanium lugs, bonding into carbon tubes is just super cool. Combined with Dave Weagle's experience of doing the DW6 system for that bike, I just think it's an incredible approach. Now from what I've seen in the flesh, they look really cool, but let's just think a bit about the brand. How does a trio like that actually make a brand and, and do this? Now, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. Now, obviously they're going the crowdfunding route and I've heard some people say, well, why don't they just you know, get an investment, um, private investment, well, they kind of did that. The other option is, why don't they just get a whack and great loan against their names, they must have enough money. Yeah, but they could do that, but business is about risk, isn't it? So you've got to manage the risk uh, in order to actually succeed, really. They could arguably do that and they may well succeed, but. That's a lot of risk and it's a massive move for them to do. So teaming up with Pierce Linney, who becomes their, or became their angel investor to lead that process was a no brainer. The guy is into mountain biking anyway, and as well as being a very serious businessman, he's a perfect person to position himself behind a brand like that. But what's interesting is the crowdfunding approach. Now, I don't know that much about crowdfunding, but I've seen a lot of negativity and comments about it, saying, oh, why don't they just borrow their money and get on with it, they don't need this. Oh, you might be able to own like this percentage of Atherton bikes. I think it's cool. You make an investment into the brand, you get some shares, you get some equity in a form of shares, which later you could do whatever you wanted to with, but ultimately you become part of something very unique. Now, I think what Athertons are actually doing is is brilliant and I'm not sure anyone else in the bike industry could actually do this, at least not now. I think it's gonna take this to be a success to pave the way for future brands to come forwards. And that's really what I wanna talk about. Um, we're not looking at this in a Kickstarter aspect where you come up with a cool idea for a product in order to get it funded to get it out to the market. This is much bigger than that. This is a huge brand that we're making kids bikes, e-mounted bikes, maybe even town bikes. They could be enormous but they've got to start at the top, they've got to start with the high-end product, making their own bikes themselves. Of course, that all takes massive amounts of money in order to finance that sort of stuff. And let's not forget about the numbers themselves. So, quoting directly from their website, they say they're aiming to sell 2,500 units in three years' time. That's a lot of bikes to build, given the fact that they're not really a business yet, and they're not in operation as such and they want to build 7,500 bikes by five years' time. Don't forget, the process of building their bikes takes substantially longer. You think what they're going to need to do, so they're bringing what was their manufacturing process by using Renishaw, they're bringing that in-house. So as well as the equipment, which is going to cost a fortune, you need the operators of the equipment, perhaps some current operators, and then you're going to need to train up some new ones. So staff training, as well as the staff and the machines, a building for the machines and the factory process, like the manufacturing part of it to be in. Then you've got the materials, the in and out of the materials. You've got a warehouse to store the bikes when they're done, logistics to go with that, marketing team to get the bikes and information into the media and get it out there to everyone. Suddenly, it starts becoming a very big thing. They're basically starting a bike brand from fresh. And we're not talking about any of these smaller sort of privateer brands. They're actually going in whole hog to do full on manufacturing. I think it's super interesting. Uh, and I really do wanna go and see them and actually find a bit more about it myself. But I'd love to know what you think about this sort of process. Is it something that interests you? Would you wanna be an investor? In fact, are any of you out there, um, are any of you out there even, have you invested? I'd love to know. Um, I'm gonna start looking on their website more to find out and watch this because they pitched for 600 grand and they're already over a million with I think about 22 days left at current and it's soaring so I'd love to know what's going to go on and I'll definitely be diving a bit deeper into this but do you think they're doing something that no one else is going to be able to do or do you think that you're going to see more brands doing this sort of approach in the future genuinely love to know let us know in those comments underneath and in the meantime check out their website there's a link at the bottom of the screen and there's one in the description under this and you can also check out information on the crowdfunding process it's actually pretty interesting okay so straight into news now and let's talk about the brand new shoes from specialized the 2fo roost they come in two versions clip and flat I've got a set of the clip ones here, although visually at a glance, they do look the same as the flat. So I guess these are the better ones to talk about because they have a bit more going on. 
Now they're available in two colors uh, in each style. In the flat pedal version, they come in black and they also come in a color called oak. Looks like army green to me, and that's probably the one I'd pick. Or in the clip version, they come in black or taupe, which is um, kind of like a dark sandy color. Either way, they're very cool looking. Now, the sole on them has a nice sticky rubber. This is a Slipknot rubber, the third version of that. And I think if you measure it actually using a Shore Edge durometer tester, you're looking at around, around 52, 54A, um, give or take. Um, got to take that with a pinch of salt because of the way the durometer testers work, but nice soft compound rubber on the sole, good for gripping on the pedals. Nice big cleat recess there, clear markings loads of space around that cleat so that's going to be brilliant for getting in when it's muddy thought of mountain bikers there they've got their lollipop shank in the sole so super stiff this way but this direction there's as you can see is loads of toe flex so that's going to be so comfortable off the bike so actually a hot tip for the clip ones if you ride to work or ride to college or school you can actually get where we're using these on a day-to-day -day basis as a pair of trainers um, super cool but they're plenty stiff enough for performance riding now the upper on them they have their little elastic lace retainer on the tongue there but essentially it feels like a decent set of skate shoes on but actually quite light as well and the cool thing about it is is they've got this padding on the inside of them called Expel Air. Now it's a hydrophobic padding so what that basically means is it won't soak up water. It doesn't mean you're going to stay dry like it's just hydrophobic padding. The cool thing is it means they're not going to suck up water so it'll dry quicker and they're not going to stink. Now the older versions of these shoes were excellent but they could feel a little bit tough. Uh, they had a slightly more plasticky feel around the front. These literally feel like a decent set of skate shoes like by Vans or something like that. Um, I think they're mega cool. Now they come in sizes 38 to 48. In the UK they retail for 110 quid for the clips or the flats. Or in US dollars it's 120 for the flats and 130 for the clips. I think they look awesome. Check them out. Okay, so next up in news is a pair of handguards with a difference. Now, if you're like me, you look at handguards and you see Sam Hill riding them, or you look at any of the top EWS pros, you're like, yeah, actually it looks really cool and totally practical with the nature of the racing. But you couldn't imagine putting them on your own bike on a daily basis. I think they just look pretty awful, to be fair. Um, if you disagree with me, let me know down there. I think they look awful unless you're racing. If you're a racer, I think that suddenly comes into their own. However, I can definitely see the benefits. Now, Rev Grips, do you remember them? They make those grips with the float backwards and forwards uh, to essentially act as a vibration damper on the bars. Well, they decided that they were kind of useful to have in certain situations on the trails, but they too didn't like the look of them. So they've developed these. Um, beautiful T6, I think it is, yeah, T6 billet aluminium mounts on them, so just gorgeously made with a real high strength flexing polycarbonate uh, smoke effect shield on the front. So at a glance, you don't even see they're there. Now that I really like. Now, unfortunately though, there is a bit of a privilege to um, pay for this, and that is the cost. So they retail for, in the UK, 80 quid, so it's about the same in, uh, in euros. 80 quid for a set of handguards. Is that crazy expensive or is that just me? Or would you think, actually, I'd have a set of them for my bike because you can't see them and they do the job. I think they're really cool. Slightly concerned about the cost, but would like to see some in the flesh at the same time. Uh, what do you think? Are handguards cool? Are handguards awful? Would you run these ones? Or do you prefer the full factory look of having your own name blazing across the front? Uh, let us know down there. Okay, next up is a UK-based hardtail. Now, there's a bike shop called Stiff. They're based up north in the UK. They've been one of the oldest existing bike shops uh, somewhere. In fact, I used to think it through the pages of MBUK magazine and look at their massive adverts, which used to span four pages. I used to circle all the things in a highlighter marker when I was a kid, deciding what I wanted for Christmas. Obviously, I never got any of it, but that's what it was like when you were a kid. I used to look at things that you couldn't have. Now they're now making bikes, and their first bike was called the Morph. Uh, it was a 27 and a half inch wheel or a 650B, aggressive UK style hardtail based on a 130mm fork, steel frame, and it was great value, and it still is great value. Now there's a 29 version, and this is it. A uh, really cool video featuring some of the workers from Stiff. A uh, nice bit of human, I think it was made, put together by Sam Needham, the photographer, very cool guy. Now the frame essentially looks like a similar version of the Morph, but I think it looks slightly more modern. Uh, being a 29er, it has to have slightly more aggressive geometry in order to cater for that. So it's got, so 430 mm chain stays out back, 64 degree head angle up front, a really steep 78 degree seat angle. So bang on, on point at the moment. 
It's also got what's called a shotgun yoke down by the chainstay there. They had that on the morph as well to keep the rigidity but give loads of clearance down there and a bit of a nod to the northern thing. Uh, very cool, I think. Um, made from 4130 chromoly as well, so it's going to have a nice resilient ride. The best thing of all is it is available in some specs to build. Comes in three uh, sizes, medium, large, extra large, reach going from 460, 480 to 500. Comes in a silver that you can see here. The bone, which is actually bang on, bang on point, but I'd have the teal, I reckon. Oh, how cool does that look? 599 for a frame only. For that price, I'd actually say that is a damn good shout to buy and have that as a secondary frame. And for winter, swap all your gear from your current bike onto it and go and rip that up all winter, reserving your full suspension. I think it's mega cool. Well, it's based on a 130mm one, uh, fork, by the way, just like the Morph, but you can run a longer fork. You can run a short fork if you wanted to. Obviously, your BB will get a bit lower and your seat angle will get a bit steeper, but I think it looks like a banging bike, and the video for it is ace. Uh, check out the video. We're going to put a link to that in the description underneath. Very cool stuff from the guys at Stiff. Okay, so next up in news is a set of mid-range wheels from Raceface called the A-Effect. Now, the cool thing about these is they sit in a direct portion, portion of the market where wheels are kind of left alone a bit. You put a lot of money into the entry-level wheels to get the wheels functional for the money, and then, of course, more expensive wheels have loads of money pumped at them. But kind of mid-range point are kind of neglected a bit, I think it's fair to say. Now, these look excellent. Not just mid-range mid in price point, but I think nearly high-end in terms of performance for what they can offer. So there's two wheels, the A-Effect R, the A-Effect R EMTB, and then there's the hub themselves, the Trace Hub, uh, of which is featured on both the wheel sets. Now the A-Effect R has a 6069 alloy rim with a 30mm internal width and an offset rim design. So bang up to date for a nice strong rim. Um, obviously it's alloy, so you could bend it back if you needed to. And of course it's gonna offer nice support for tires. 28 spoke J-Bend spoke design on the R wheels. On the EMTB version of them, they have 32 spokes. So just a little bit more for a little bit more strength. Now I've got the same hubs on both of them. Now it's got 10 degree rotation with 36 points of engagement on that. So it's a really decent hub. Uh, not the fastest engagement, but that's no bad thing. I think people get a bit obsessed with fast. Uh, fast engagement. Now they're $500 for the wheel set, which I think is great value for what they offer, genuinely. Um, 2,000 grams they weigh in the 29 inch, there's a variety of different sizes. Now like I said, with the EMTB version, they've got more spokes, they're a little bit stronger. They also have a steel rear axle and a steel free hub body on there, so the body comes in micro spline or XD. So they're really thinking of the extra power and torque that destroys hubs going into those. They do cost a bit more though, uh, 649 for a pair. Um, or you can buy the rear only for 399 So that could be a really good upgrade for any budding e-mountain bikers out there. Now the hub itself has 13 different versions across Boost, Super Boost, Num Boost, etc. There's loads of different options available. Um, XD, Micro Spline, uh, E, E Steel cassette body on there. Uh, again, 10 degree rotation, 36 points of engagement. 8499 for the front, 214 for the rear bargain set of wheels. Genuinely, I think they look like a really good set of wheels if you're into your mid-range price points. And last up in news, I just want to throw a few cool things around from Instagram that I've been seeing. Now this one that's on screen now, this custom pair of shoes from Taz Designs, it's just super cool, it's ridiculous. It's a set of Nike Air Force Ones customized with a set of what looks like Rocket Ron Schwalbe tires just bonded on there with trees and all sorts of other cool stuff. Now, there's a bit of a story there. I urge you to check out Taz Designs, make some cool, super cool custom trainers. Uh, for the record, if you ever see a Taz, I want to get in touch and get a set off you. I think they are so cool, ridiculously cool. I mean, I wouldn't wear this particular colour, but they were done for someone. I'd have sl something slightly different done, but I think they look mega. Uh, give them a follow, his handle's on the bottom of the screen. Wicked stuff, love looking at this. Next up, Hans Ray. I want to give him a bit of a big up, actually. Uh, one of the oldest serving pro mountain bikers out there. Um, been sponsored for an awful long time and look at his Instagram page, you'll see why. He's throwing up stuff that he used to do out of his own pocket years ago, all his old stuff from VHS. Honestly, if you've not seen his videos, go and subscribe to his YouTube channel and he's putting a lot of that content up on there now. now go and check out some of his older videos. They're so old now, they actually look new and they look like what the kids are all trying to replicate with VHS and DV video recorders. Super cool stuff. Hans, you're one of the reasons we're all doing it here at GMBN, so uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, next up, a set of gold Kuro brakes from Formula. Just look at them. <laughs> they just look gorgeous. Um, I just like looking at bike things, and hopefully you do too. Now, has anyone out there ridden those Kuro brakes, or have you got a set of these? I'd love to know what they're like. Curiosity killed the cat. 
In recent times I've ridden quite a few Namagura brakes, I've ridden pretty much all the Shimano and SRAM brakes, but I've yet to ride trick stuff and I've yet to ride formula. Um, I've ridden some old formula, the Oros, uh, I've got the Greg Minor edition ones tucked away somewhere at home, um, but I've never ridden these and I'd love to know about them. Let us know in those comments and if there's anyone cool on Instagram that deserves a shout out, let us know about them in those comments. Okay, so now let's jump into the comments section show and pick up on what you were talking about last week. Now we're talking about kids' bikes and how cool they are, or how cool I thought they were. Uh, it seems a lot of you agree with me. Uh, David Jennings though says, if your kids' bike can't get you tetanus, you're doing it wrong. I kind of get that, things can feel a bit sterile these days. They were definitely far more dangerous when we were growing up or when I was growing up, but uh, they're definitely better now, that's for sure. Um, Sean Anthony, just picked up a San Quentin 24 for my little guy. He's a huge Matt Jones fan, so it worked out perfect that it came out this year. I rolled around on the cheap department store BMX when I was a kid. Nothing like what they have today. Yeah, absolutely, it's amazing. And I just think, come on, they're the kids, they're the next riders, just give it to them, just let them get there quicker. Uh, let's see what mountain biking can do in the next 10 years. It's gonna be insane, it really is. Uh, next one, this one's close to my heart from Sharpie108. I had a Rally Lizard, absolute tank of a bike, but it went everywhere, uh, I went everywhere on it. Yeah, I remember the Lizard well, and it's all pale green finish with the little black lizards all over it. Uh, it was actually kind of a cool bike. You either had a Peugeot Mustang, uh, sorry, a Rally Mustang, a Rally Lizard. Um, if you were posh, you had the activator with a suspension fork on the front, which was awful and weighed a ton, or you had the Peugeot equivalents, which I had, and a few other people in the comments sound like they did as well. Max says, my first mountain bike was a Carrera Katmandu with a Gervin flex stem. That's one of these bad boys. <laughs> that was early mountain bike suspension when you couldn't afford a pair of rock shocks. How cool, awful, but cool. Uh, in the early 90s when Carrera were good. Hey, Carrera is still quite a reputable brand. Uh, definitely more on the budget and entry level end, but they're, I get it, they're not what they were. They used to make some really high-end cool bikes. Uh, good brand, good to hear, hear that as well, actually. Next up's from Tim Sadler, our oh, big ups to Tim. Um, huge fan, Tim. Thanks for tuning into the channel. Uh, Tim works behind loads of cool brands, including Gorillapod. I've got loads of those things flying around here somewhere. First mountain bike I saw was my mate's Pooch, Pooch, Puck. All I can remember was Mudcast 3. I got his Puck, the reason why? Puck and Ugly, Puck and Gutless, Puck and Bucket, a Puck and <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny anyway. Um, I then got a Peugeot Safari. My twin sister got the Hawaii. I don't remember the Hawaii, but I do remember the Safari. Uh, but if we're going back to Little Rippers, it would be my Grifter. I'm comparing to the bike the kids have to ride now. They don't know how could they have it. True, the Grifter was cool. They had a gear stick, didn't it? And they had mud guards. It was kind of like an off-road version of a chopper from what I remember. Um, a friend, had, One of my friends had a Boxer. I think it was a little bit like one of those. However, you soon realize the difference with big mountain bikes when you hit up a trail center with an 11-year-old on a standard kid's mountain bike. The suspension and brakes are just shocking, so I can really see the market for mini bikes with big spec. Uh, yeah, 100%, I mean, it's crazy. In our lifetimes, Tim, what's happened in mountain biking, where it's going, it's like a new sport, what we have now, I think it's unbelievable as well. Josh Singleton, on the subject of kids' bikes, I've been shopping around for my nephew's first proper mountain bike. I think the most cost-effective kids' bikes these days are the ones with bigger tyres. This is because you get quite high up in the price point. The suspension is next to no good though because they're always sprung too hard for the lightweight of the kids riding them. So the way to get around this is the big volume tyre running at low pressures to act as suspension. Yeah, 100%. Um, although the lighter bikes are Isla bikes, early riders and frog bikes are really good. But as soon as you get to any rough terrain, the kids are just not strong enough to muscle them through. I kind of get that because they're using the much slimmer and lighter weight wheels and tyres. Double-edged sword there, isn't it? Um, I guess it depends, ultimately, uh, the strength and the height and like, size of your child and also where they're going to ride it. Um, I would want my kid to be on a lighter bike first, definitely, so they can at least get the control aspects of the bike before putting them on something with a heavier tyre where it's like, roots, go, <laughs> sort of thing. But yeah, I 100% see what you're, where you're going with that. Completely agree. Uh, suspension, yeah, maybe skip sack off the suspension at the cheaper end and rely a bit more on the tires, but you don't want too much weight on the bike at all because it hinders the kid, it? and the kid's not strong enough. And the last one, actually, this is based around those nylon pedals that we featured from DMR, uh, from Tony Hruzek, who actually says something quite cool. I love nylon stroke glass pedals because when I get pedal strikes, it deadens the collision. Never thought of that, totally get that. You know when that awful sort of metallic bang that sometimes resonates through the bike that you get with metal pedals, of course, you're not going to get that with nylon pedals. I actually need to try some because I've never ridden off-road in a set. So I'm going to try some and see if I agree with you, but I think I probably will. Uh, thanks for commenting, everyone. Always cool to uh, hear what you're up to in those comments. Keep them coming.
Okay, so now it's the return of the quiz. Um, I thought I'd keep chopping and changing the show around a little bit, keep it a bit more interesting. So quiz, I'm gonna ask you three questions. You're not gonna look on your phones. You're gonna try and rack into your brains of uh, mountain bike knowledge. Now, hopefully you've got some off from us and give me the answers. Okay, so first question coming up on screen right now. Which bicycle brand makes the following things in addition to bikes? Helmets, tires, clothing, and shoes. Any ideas? Number two, next question. What was the name of the bike company that developed the way that Atherton bikes are now manufacturing their bikes? Here's one for people who have been pay, pay, paying attention even. Did you get it? No, we'll come back to that in a bit. And the last one, what is the Shore A scale? This one is for the proper nerds out there. Come on, come on. You're all with me on this, aren't you? You must be, come on. Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. We're jumping into the Bike Cave. So, if you've got a Bike Cave, if you've got a cool garden shed, the back of a pickup truck, under the stairs, wherever it is, you keep your bike and you work on your bike and you fettle it and you treat it nicely, treat it to a nice bit of wet lube here and there, show us some pictures, show and tell. Um, or a little video clip would be really cool. The link to our upload is at the bottom of the screen here and it's also in the description underneath. Send us your pictures and we'll feature you on the show. We love checking out your bike caves. Now, first up is from Matt in Cheltenham, Gloucester. He's got a 1997 GT Zasker. Wow, 24 cycles, Latoy 3. Flipping it, don't hear of those much these days. Watch Sprung 5 online and you'll see loads of those things being ridden by the Frenchies. Awesome stuff. Um, Kona Shred, Specialized P2 and a DBR. Okay, so recently kicked out of a mate's garage, so needed somewhere to move all of the bikes and equipment consisting of wall storage for six bikes, workbench, mint sauce shrine, uh, MBUK reader there, uh, two barbecue racer uh, mini bikes, full suspension, uh, as well as helmet, gloves, coat, etc. So let's have a look then. Okay, so that'll be the mini bikes. Look at those things. They look insane. They look insanely dangerous is what they look like. About as dangerous as those really annoying electric scooters that I keep seeing people around here going through potholes and wondering why they're nearly killing themselves. But, um, but hey, they look kind of fun at the same time. And I love your black conduit. That looks really cool. Nice little speaker dock in the corner. Is that a Bose one? Mint Source Shrine. Very cool. Good use of the handlebars there with the Mint Source Mud Guard. Not seen a cover mount used like that before. Very cool. You should send that into the guys at MBK. They'd like that. Bench unit. Super neat and tidy. 100% approved of that. I'd sit down and do a day's work there. I think that looks awesome, mate. Nice and clean, tidy and organized. Easy to clean, easy to work on your bikes. Nice work, and there's your bike rack, more importantly. Yep, super good, top and tail with your bike, so you get them all in without scratching stuff. All ready to ride. That's the dream, that's the absolute dream. What a cool setup. Uh, nice one, Matt. Okay, next up is over to Aiden in Devon. Hi Doddy, so after living in a flat and keeping a bike in a spare room, I moved house in lockdown, and it gave me a lot of time to get a shed and turn it into a bike cave. I love a good shed. Um, little wood. Workbench at the back, load of sign posters, etc., some banners from my local bike shop that unfortunately closed recently. Uh, big shout out to Jay Cowley. Big shout out to Jay Cowley. Um, I love it. I've got lights in the roof, electric for charging the e bike. I know it's not the NBN show. Hey, I love e bikes. I love all bikes. And it's all good except for road bikes. <laughs> Only joking. Uh, would love the chance to have been on the show. Love the show and keep up the great work. Well, let's have it a little. A little bit of a look. Of course, you've got an Elliot Heap jersey in there. Very cool. Nice, nice vertically mounted tools. Got your drill on the tool board as well. Your O'Neill banner. That's good. I guess that's also concealing stuff underneath it as well. Double usage. Good stuff. Decent spades as well. Or pitchfork. Your cleaning station in the corner there. Nice. You've got a little jet wash down the bottom. Is that a Moby? Can't tell from here. Could be a Moby. The outside is shed, your 100% logo on there. Halo on the side. Flip, mate, you've got a serious amount of banners, haven't you? Hey, this rad. There's your Merida e bike, your Merida doormat as well. Perfect. Wipe your feet on the way into the shed. Love it. Awesome stuff. Thank you for showing us your bike caves. Keep them coming in, and we'll see you on next week's show. Okay, now, I'm back to the quiz for some answers. Now, how did you get on? Anyone out there get all three right? So the first answer uh, to the bike company that make a range of other products, of course, is Specialized. 
Specialized are one of those brands, they seemingly make everything, and annoyingly, they do it really well as well. You can't even be like, oh, they do crap tires. They make really good tires. As you saw on the show this week, they make really good shoes. They make really good bikes. They're just like annoying. Just do something wrong, Specialized. You're too good. Uh, next up, of course, the brand that gave Afton bikes or paved the way for Afton bikes with their technology was Robot Bikes. Now, if you type in Robot Bikes into Google, I'm sure you'll find a bunch of pieces online about them. Uh, an identical manufacturing process, but Robot Bikes was a very small scale production system. There was, I think it was literally two or three people there. Um, but the Athertons obviously saw the, basically the huge potential in working in the way they work with the material. So the way that the additive manufacturing works is essentially 3D printing with titanium dust, more or less. Um, it's almost zero waste with the way that you work with it. It's so cool, but of course it's a very expensive and laborious process to get it done. Of course, once the computer's been programmed, it's amazing because you, you have the lugs all come out as one single unit and each one is cut off then and then bonded onto a selection of tubes. And then the tubes, of course, because it's building the bike, you can have these any length you want. So it's super easy to keep a stock of tubing ready in order to build whatever size bikes you want. And of course, just tweaking the geometry on those lugs once the lug design is done, in theory, should be something relatively straightforward to give custom geometry options. That's definitely something they did off with robot bikes. And of course, Athens have been working with them to refine that process. Can't wait to sling a leg over one at some point. G did actually message me a while back and suggested that I come up and have a go on one. So, um, mildly terrified of riding with him again, but um, I'd love to. I haven't seen him for a long time too. So, uh, watch this space. And next up was what is this Shaw A scale? Anyone? Who was watching news earlier on and who saw me pull this out? It's a Shaw A gyrometer tester for testing the rubber gyrometer. Uh, of course, it's far more accurate when you do this on tires than it is on the sole of shoes. But it'll give you a good indication of your tire compounds. I use this quite often just to refer to tires. So you can see on the case of Victoria tires where they have four compounds, you can see there's four very different readings that come off this. And um, why would I want this? Just for personal knowledge, but uh, tires are made to gyrometer ratings. The higher the number, say 60A gyrometer, it's gonna be a slightly harder wearing tire with slightly less grip. And a softer number like 42A, for example, it's gonna be extremely soft, extremely grippy, and it's gonna wear out really fast accordingly. So that is why you'd wanna incorporate lots of different gyrometers of rubber into a tire or at least a dual compound. So you can have a harder rubber on the center of the tread, uh, giving it rolling speed and wear resistance and a softer tread on the shoulders for giving you all that all important grip in the turns where you really do need it. But, uh, but cool stuff. How did you get on? Anyone get all three right? Hmm. Let us know in those comments what you got. And that's pretty much it for this week. I'd love to know what you thought about the Atherton stuff at the beginning of the show. I'm really interested in the crowdfunding thing. I'm kind of half interested to sort of get involved myself, but, um, but I haven't got any money, so I'm not going to do that. But um, I'd love to know if anyone has got involved with it. Definitely keen to find out a bit more. Okay, great stuff. Thanks for watching, as always. And we'll see you on next week's show. Ta-ra.